I'm a big, big believer that before you use a front end framework like Angular, React, Vue, you should have really good core JavaScript skills. So in this video, let's try to build on those skills by building a tic-tac-toe game with vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So I wanna start by saying that this video is sponsored by Scrimbo, one of the most unique and interesting platforms out there. And I think as an aspiring web developer, there's lots of free content out there on YouTube, just like this video that you're watching now. But what Scrimba can offer you is a complete front-end developer career path. They're going to walk you through uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, responsive design, APIs, uh, React, Git, and then getting into getting hired, your resume and soft skills and things like that. So this front-end developer career path has 75 hours of content, hundreds of coding challenges, study group access where you can join a Discord with other like-minded individuals who are going through the same exact thing you are. So if you compare the monthly subscription to the front end developer career path on Scrimba to a boot camp that can cost thousands of dollars up front, it's a no brainer. There's no reason not to give this a shot. There's a link below. You'll get to do some amazing content on one of the most interactive platforms out there. So check out the link below, give it a shot and let me know what you think. All right, to so just show you really quickly what this is going to look like. Uh, this is a tic-tac-toe game, which you've probably seen before. And we've got our board down here. We've got our X's and O's. We've got a restart button. And then we've got text to show uh, which one of the users wins. Hopefully one of them wins. So that's what we're going to build. And we're going to do this all with vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Nothing, no packages, no libraries, nothing like that. So let's start with creating our index HTML file. And one of the really cool things inside of VS Code is that you can hit this bang character, the exclamation, and then autocomplete after pressing enter to uh, create the boilerplate for an HTML file. And I'm gonna zoom in here so we can see this a little bit better. So here, I'm gonna rename this document to tic-tac-toe. And then I'm also gonna create an app CSS file and an app JS file. And we'll go ahead and import those. So we'll want our link to our CSS file up here, and this will be app CSS. And then at the bottom of our body, we'll have a script tag with the source being our app JS. So we should have both of those linked together. And uh, let's just go ahead and do all the markup up front. So uh, there won't be a whole lot of HTML. We'll do a lot of styling on this, and then we'll add a lot of our game logic inside of JavaScript, which I'm really excited to get to. So I'm gonna use some Emmet snippets here. Dot container will create a div uh, with a class of container. I've got a video on Emmet snippets if this is new to you. So I'm gonna create a container, and then inside of this container, I'm gonna have a title, so an H1, and this is going to be, uh, have an ID of play, text. I didn't really have a, a better name for that. And it's going to start off by saying, uh, let's just play. So let's play. Uh, then I want a button. And this is going to be a button with an ID of restart button. Obviously, we'll use this in our JavaScript to be able to restart our game and uh, tell that to be restart. And then next, we want a div with an ID of game board. So this is actually going to be the board itself. And the way this is going to work is we're going to have nine different boxes that represent our board. So there'll be kind of uh, blank boxes and then we'll add borders to each one to get the grid system set up there. So I want to have this div with an ID of container so I can do, or not ID of container, ID of game board. So I can have an ID of game board. And then inside of that game board, I want to have uh, nine different divs with a class of box. So I can do a dot box and then times nine. So this will create, you can see the little, um, view up here of what's to come. We've got a div with an ID of game board and then inside of it, we've got nine boxes uh, with a class of box and also want to have an ID. Of, I'm going to start with just uh, one in here. So let's go ahead and auto complete that. Again, if you're new to Emmet, you could type all this stuff out. No worries there at all. But this is a really quick way to be able to generate this markup uh, that I really like using. So the only thing is we'll go through and update these. So uh, these would just be one through nine. And actually, I actually want these, and actually I want these to be zero based index. So I'm going to go ahead and update those that way. All right. So this will start at zero and go up through nine. Now what we can do is I've got an extension called the live server extension in VS code, which is amazing. You should absolutely check it out, especially for vanilla HTML, CSS, and JavaScript stuff. So if I right click in my HTML file, I can click the open with live server. What this will do is it will open a live server inside of my browser at port 5,500. So here it is right here. So there's our game. And just to kind of show you that this works, I could type in some dummy text here and notice that this will auto reload with that uh, new text there, which is really cool. So we don't want that. 
And now let's start to give kind of some base styles to our application. And uh, we're going to use this purple color. Uh, and I'm going to use CSS variables for this. You can kind of see this purple color here. That's what we want to use in several different places. So we're going to use CSS variables to do this. We'll have a dot root element. And then on that dot root element, we'll declare a variable called purple. And then it will be a 3E0249. All right, so that's going to be our purple color that we will reuse. And then we'll have our body. Uh, we'll get rid of all the margin on our body. So margin and padding will be zero. It will use our var purple variable. So that will be the color of text inside of the body. And the font family, nothing too fancy here. We'll just set this to a sans serif. Next, I'm going to set everything to a box sizing of border box. So what that means is uh, these elements will now, if you define a width and height for them, that width and height will include the border and the padding. So if you have border and padding, that will be included in the height and the width of the element itself. So uh, next up, we have our H1, and uh, we'll just give that a general uh, kind of big font there, 54, and then we'll go ahead and uppercase that text. So tra text transform of uppercase, and you can start to see this coming in a little bit. So there's our purple color, there's our big text. Uh, the next thing we want to have is our container. Now this is the thing that's going to kind of position everything. And so we'll add some padding to it, uh, 40 pixels. And then we want it to take up the entire height of the screen. So we'll set the height to 100 view height. So that will take up the entire height of the screen. And then I'm going to make this a display of flex. And the reason is I want to display all the content in the very center of the screen. So we'll do a justify content center and then align items center as well. This will make sure that all of that stuff is centered uh, in the screen. And then you'll notice uh, this is going to put these things side by side. We want them to be top to bottom. So we'll do a flex direction of columns. This will kind of stack them on top of each other. So that's starting to look close to what we want. The last thing is the game board, or I guess two things, the game board, the boxes, three things, maybe game board boxes and the button. So let's grab our game board. And uh, I guess let's actually style these boxes first. So let's do these boxes so I can show you what this is going to look like. So we'll have our individual box. They're going to be 150 pixels by 150 pixels. So this is important because we're going to use specific sizes here. We're going to set a box to be a display of flex. This is going to be the exact same reasoning as we did before, where we want to have the justify content and align items centered. So that will make sure to center the content, which will be the letter X and O right inside of that box. And then lastly, we'll set the uh, var or set the color to our purple variable. And just so we can see these boxes, I'm going to add a background of red. So background color of red, just so we can see them to start. So you see, we have a lot of these and they're kind of stacked on top of each other. We obviously don't want them stacked on top. We want them to kind of uh, wrap around. So we want there to be three per row and then wrap around. So the way we'll do this, we know that each of these is 150 pixels by 150 pixels. We're going to take our game board, which is the container for all of that. And we're going to set the width to 450 pixels. And then we can also use Flexbox again. So display of flex. Uh, the flex direction naturally will be row. So it'll go one, two, three. And then we want it to wrap. So there's a flex wrap property or we can tell it to wrap those elements. So once it gets to 450 pixels, which will be three, it'll wrap down to the next line. And then I'm just gonna add some margin top here of 40 pixels to give this some spacing. So now when we go and look, let's see if we have the right, I think this is a lowercase b game board. Now, if we look, so you see this big block now, and this is each individual element. We can see these. If we come into inspect and hover, you can see these are the different blocks. So those are actually lining up exactly how we want. We just don't want to have that uh, big, bold red color. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. Get rid of that red color. And then uh, just for a little bit of kind of moving along here, I'm going to uh, copy in the button style. So these are fairly straightforward. Let me copy them in. Uh, we'll add some padding, some border radius, uh, background color, again, using that uh, purple color, uh, including the border, uh, font size, then we'll transition. So when we hover, we'll translate that thing up two pixels. So let's save that and then we can see uh, what this looks like. So a little bit of hover effect there to make that thing uh, move up. So that's perfect. Now we're ready to jump into our JavaScript and actually uh, start to work on the logic for this and start to actually draw our board. 
So the first thing we're going to do is actually draw the board. So to do this, what we're doing is for the top, the elements that are on the top row, we want to add a border bottom. For the elements on the bottom row, we want to add a border top. For the elements on the left, we want to add a border right. And for the elements on the right, we want to add a border left, if that makes sense. So let's go ahead and just kind of give this a shot. So to do this, we're going to need to get access to each of the different boxes. So if you remember inside of here, we've got class name of box. So we want to get a reference to all of those. So there is the document.get elements by class name function that we can call. And we tell it we want to get all the ones with a class of box. And then we want to assign that to a variable. And uh, just to kind of show what this returns, let's log this out. So let's log out boxes here. And this will also kind of prove that our JavaScript is connected. Well, boxes returns uh, what's in this case an HTML collection, but we actually want an array. So we can convert this to an array by calling array.from and then passing that in. So this will give us a, a natural array in JavaScript that we're used to. And then from there, we want to create our draw board function. So const draw board, and you'll see that I use arrow functions here. So this is my arrow function definition here. And then we want to take each of our boxes and we want to iterate through them. So for each one, we'll get a reference to the box itself and the index. And then what do we want to do? Well, I want to end up building a style string. So the styles that I want to add to this box, which in some elements is just uh, one border, some is two borders. Uh, so we want to build that up through our JavaScript. So let's start with kind of using this idea of the accumulator pattern where we have a style string. And this is just going to start off as an empty string. And then we want to do a couple of different checks and update that style string along the way. So let's first check if index is less than three. And uh, maybe take a second to pause and think about what this means. But I'll go ahead and tell you, uh, if index is less than three, that means the box is on the top. So if the box is on the top, we want to add a border bottom. So we can take our style string and we can add to it a border bottom three pixels solid, and then we'll use that purple color. So var purple right here. All right, so this is basically what we're gonna do, but in a couple of different scenarios. So the other option is, and these are actually uh, just subsequent ifs. So if the index mod three is zero, meaning it's uh, cleanly divisible by three, and did I type this out right? Index mod three equals zero. If it's cleanly divisible by three, what does that tell you about that element? Again, you can pause and take a second. And then I'll tell you, uh, this is looking for there this to be an element that's on the left. So it could be on the top. But now we're checking is it also on the left? And if it is on the left, we want to add a similar thing. So let's copy and paste that style string. Let's add now a border right. So if you're on the left, you want that border on the right. Cool. Hopefully this is starting to make a little bit of sense. And so now the other option is if the index mod three equals two, and what does that tell you? Maybe pause the video and think about this. Well, this will tell you that the element is on the right hand side, which if it's on the right, we want a border on the left. So let's copy our style string again, and let's type in our border left. And then lastly, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to copy this entire one. And I'm going to say if the index is greater than five, greater than five means it's on the bottom row. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six is greater than five, which means it's on the bottom row. If it's on the bottom, we want there to be a border top. Hopefully this makes sense. I know that's a little bit, a little bit interesting to think about, I guess, but we're just drawing out this board based on where the individual boxes are. We're adding those different borders. So let's call draw board and let's see if this actually works. And it does not. And the reason is that we're not actually using our style string. So we want to take our box and say uh, style equals style string. Now let's see if we get our box and it looks a little bit off. So let's go back and double check what we are missing here. So if index is less than three, and I think we are probably missing our semicolons at the end. So we want to make sure that that statement finishes before it adds on another one. Let's give this another check and we're close, but not quite. And we didn't flip this. So this should be a uh, greater than five. So I said it out loud, but I didn't actually update it. So now let's look. Now we've got a nice little board, which is pretty cool. So the next thing is we want to be able to track like when a user clicks on these. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and set a listener for each one of these boxes. We'll say box.add event listener. 
and we're listening for the click event and we'll call a function called box clicked. We haven't defined this function yet. So now we need to go ahead and define that. So uh, box clicked is going to accept an event. So E there, and then it'll be just kind of an arrow function here. And just to kind of show that this is working, we can say box was clicked. So let's go ahead and just test out this log. Let's click on one of these and all of them seem to be working. So that's really good. So now we're getting into the logic of uh, when a box is clicked, how do we then update that square? And what we're going to do is we're going to figure out which player's turn it is. So we're going to start with O. And then every time a box is clicked, uh, if that if it's a valid click, a valid move in tic-tac-toe, uh, then we will update and switch the current player to be the opposite. So a couple of things we're going to need to track. Let's start with a couple of variables in here, const o text. And I'm this is a little probably over-engineered, but I'm just kind of setting these to some sort of constant that we can reference instead of hard coding them. That way, if you wanted to change it to y and z, you could. Uh, the next one is the x text, which I guess a better name for this would be like player one text and player two text, but it doesn't matter a whole lot. And then I'm gonna set the current player to start to the o text. All right, so this is saying this is what's going to get displayed when they play. And this variable is checking to see which player's turn it actually is. Now, the other thing we're going to need is we're going to need some way to keep track of what's already in these boxes. Because if something is in the box, we don't want to let the user click already. So let's start with a spaces array. And this is going to be an array that will have uh, nine items in it, one for each box. And let's start by setting them to all null. So we'll make sure all of these are set to null when we start. And now we're able to kind of work with, all right, what if a user clicks? Well, the first thing we want to do is get the actual ID of that element. So we'll say uh, const ID equals e.target.id. And let's log that. So this way we can tell which one of the boxes was clicked. And remember, these should be zero base index. So zero, one, uh, two here, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so those clicks are working. And now based on that index, we can check what's inside of this spaces array. So if there's nothing in that spaces array, then we're okay. So we can say if not spaces of ID, that means there's nothing in there. And then if that's the case, we're gonna update spaces, the item at uh, index ID of spaces, and we're gonna set that to the current player. Okay, so we have that. And then we're gonna take the uh, e.target, which is the actual box. We're gonna set the inner text of, uh, of that box to be the current player. So remember, current player is set to either the big X or the big O. And lastly, in here, we're gonna update the current player. So I'm gonna do this with a ternary. So if the current player equals O text, then we want to uh, make them the X text. Otherwise, we will set it to the O text. So we're basically just flipping this. If you're X, now you become O. If you're O, now you become X. So let's see what this does. Let's actually give this a shot and check in here. If we click one, there's our O, which is really small. I think we missed in our app CSS for our box. This should be a font size of 150 pixels. All right, and then that'll format. So now that'll be a little bit bigger. That looks better. And then X, O, X, O. If I click uh, the same one in here, it doesn't change. So that's good. And then I can continue to play out here. So that works. Now all we need is the logic to figure out if a player has won. And what we'll do is when we handle the submit in here, let's get rid of this extra, extra one. Before we update our current player, let's then check if a player has won. So let's say if player has one and we'll pass it the current player. Actually, we don't need to pass it the current player because it's a variable that we have access to everywhere. So if player has one, then we will update our play text and we need to get a reference to that. So we'll get, I've got a little shortcut here, which is really nice, a get ID shortcut inside of VS Code. And this uh, says that I'm gonna get a variable play text from an element by ID of play text. So if someone has one, we'll set the play text dot enter text to B, and I will use our current player, current player variable has one. 
And this is inside of ES6 backticks, uh, ES6 template literals to show that we can do variable interpolation as well as just kind of regular string stuff right inside of there. And then if the player is one, we don't want to continue. We just want to return out of this function. So now we're handling if a player has one, but we're not actually checking. So now we'll create our player has one function. And this logic gets a little interesting where, where I don't really have a better way to do this except for checking just the common ways that a user could win. So by knowing who the current player is, whatever the current player is, if the current player is X, if they have this top left thing, then you can check, all right, do they have this next right one? If they do, then do they have this next right one? Uh, or if they have this top one, do they have this middle one and this one? Or if they have this one, do they have this one and this one? So we're kind of just like enumerating on the different combinations of wins. And I'm curious if you have a, a more efficient way of solving this uh, in terms of code, let me know. But we're just gonna kind of rock through this and kind of lay out these different conditions. So we're gonna start with if spaces of zero equals the current player. So that means if the current player has this top right one, now we can check, uh, do they have either these other two or these other two or these other two? And if so, they're the winner. So this will get a little bit old, but let's type these a uh, couple of first ones out. So if uh, spaces of one, equals current player and spaces of two equals current player, then I'm just going to log uh, to say current player wins up top. So this is, uh, we could actually use this as part of our feedback to the user too, but in this case, I'm just logging this out. So I'm kind of specifying exactly how the user wins in this case. So in this case, the user wins up top and then we return true. So there's a couple of different ways. So if the user has this top right one, now we can uh, check not only do they win sideways, now do they also win diagonally? And this would be spaces of three and spaces of six. Actually, this will be on the left, sorry. So wins on the left. All right, so this will check winning on the left. So we've got winning across the top, winning on the left. Now from that same spot, we can check did the user win uh, diagonally? So zero, one, two, three, four, and then eight will be that last one. So four here and then eight on the last one. So this will be wins diagonally. So let's test, let's actually see if we can make that work. So start off with an O here, X, O, X, and go here. And it looks like I've typed in player probably instead of current player. Yeah, this one here. So. I'm gonna use multiple cursors in VS Code, which is really nice, and then update these all at the same time. So current player instead of player. So let's try this again. Let's do uh, top and then there and here. And it actually says O has one, okay. So what if, uh, we don't have restart functionality yet, so let's uh, refresh this. And what if X does the same thing? Then X has one, cool, so that works. And then we can also check, all right, what if we go diagonally? That will work, and then let's refresh again. And what if we go uh, actually, I messed that up I'm trying to test on the left. So down here, see if that wins as well. So those checks are working. Now we just need to kind of work on the um, the different possibilities for the user to win. So we saw if the user has that top left piece or that top left spot, that will work. Now we can kind of check, like, what if the user has the bottom right? So uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit and copy a lot of this code. Let's just copy the entire thing. And let's say else if, so we copied this entire thing, but what we wanna check is if the user is actually in the bottom right. So if the user has the bottom right square, then you can check up on the right, you can check over on the left, and then you don't need to check the diagonal because that's already been done. So the diagonal check we can actually get rid of here, and then we can update these things to be able to check appropriately on the right hand side. So this will be uh, two and five, and this will be wins on the right. And uh, then this one is checking on the bottom. So this one will be seven, or actually six and seven. So it has those two, uh, those two bottom left and then bottom middle. So if that's the case, user wins on the bottom. All right, and uh, we can check this one as well. So 
let's see uh, if we play and we give oh here and actually we want to go there and there and there did that work it looks like that didn't work so let's double check this so we're starting oh we actually should be checking if uh spaces of eight so that's the update here if the user has the space in the bottom right now let's try to check this that should be a winner and this should be a winner cool so that's working as well now the last combination that we need to look for is what if they have three across in the middle or three across in the or three across in the middle and or three uh, up and down in the middle i guess and i don't think this actually doesn't have to be in else they could actually have uh, that spot as well so these can just be or should just be extra if conditions so now we're checking uh spaces of if they have the middle piece which is four so if they are in the middle now we want to check does the user have the top middle and the bottom middle so let's copy again one of these and then we'll just kind of add or change up these numbers so the top middle would be one the bottom middle would be seven and so if that's the case they're gonna win vertically in the middle i guess and then let's uh, do this one more time and then in this case, what we're checking is, do they have a cross? And if they have a cross, the, the middle left one will be three and the middle right one will be five. And this will be horizontally in the middle. All right, so let's test these out too. This is a little bit tedious, but uh, let's say we start there. Uh, we used player again instead of current player. Where do we do that? There we go. This should be current player. And let's try this again. So we'll start in the middle. And then what if we go across there? That works. And then what if we do, uh, actually, we'll do X's this time since I messed up. And here, X is one. Cool. So that all is working. Now, the only thing extra that we need to do is add this restart functionality. So let's do our const restart. So we'll have our restart function. And basically, when we finish, we can set the text to whoever won. And then we can restart the game. Or actually, we probably want to leave the board there until the user decides to leave the game. So in that case, we'll get our restart button. So get ID here. I want to get the restart button. And is it uh, BTN? Let's just double check here. Yeah, BTN for restart button. So we'll get that restart button. And then we're going to add an event handler to our restart button. So event or restart button add event listener and this is listening for a click event and then we'll have the callback here and then we can actually do our restart so we don't actually need a separate restart function now we can just do our restart right inside of the restart button event handler so uh what i want to do is we may actually be able to uh, completely wipe out the array and just set it to an empty array uh, but uh, just to be kind of sure on this, we want to basically wipe out each space inside of our spaces array. So we'll do a for each and we'll get the space and the index. And then for each space, we want to set the space index to null. So we're basically resetting that thing to what it was before. Then we also want to wipe out the text in the boxes. So boxes dot for each and we'll get a uh, reference to the box. And then for the given box, we wanna set the inner text to be an empty string. So we wanna get rid of the text that's inside of there. Then we can grab the play text, set the inner text to be let's play again. So we'll kind of reset that thing to what it was initially. And I think I need to use back ticks in this case so that I can use my single quote in there. And then lastly, we'll reset the current player to the O. And so interestingly enough, what we can do now is instead of initializing spaces up here with all of these nulls, and instead of initializing our current player, we can just have those variables be there. And then we can call, before we call our draw board, we could call that restart function, but we don't actually have it as a separate function. So I lied, we do want to break this out. So let's break this out into a new function. And we don't actually need the E in here. We don't need the event, even though this is a click. And let's grab all the stuff that's inside of this. And let's say this is going to call restart. 
we'll paste all of this into restart. And let's get a little bit of formatting here. And then let's just call restart before we call draw game board. So this will make sure that it updates all of our spaces with nulls. It will make sure that all of the inner text of the boxes are set. And then it will set the player uh, inner text and we'll update the current player. So let's see what this looks like. Hopefully this will work. Missing initializer in const declaration for, oh, we actually just need to initialize this to an empty array and hopefully that will take care of it. So let's restart and can't access restart before it is defined. Let's move the event handler down below that function. So we wanna make sure that we have that function defined before we actually use it inside of our button. So now the board gets drawn. We can do O, X, O, X, O. That's a winner. Restart. That works. Now we can do uh, O. And in this case, it's not letting us click. So let's go back and double check. When we try to play, what is it checking in here? And we can probably actually just log out what our spaces is. And in this case, it looks like it's doing... Uh, something weird here. What's in spaces is not quite what we expected. So let's double check that logic. We've got our spaces dot for each and uh, we've got our space and index space at index should be null. I would think or actually space is at index should be null. That's what it is. So now let's try this again. Let's try to play. That's a winner restart. And then can we play again? Yes, we can. And does that win? Cool. And let's just double check and X can win. So we can go up there. And here and here, X is one as well. And we've got our restart here and all of this stuff works really well. Let me clear, clear that out. Uh, that's not how that works. Clear, there we go. So anyway, I like I said at the beginning of this video, I think having core HTML, CSS and JavaScript skills is really, really important to being a web developer. This may seem like a trivial example or maybe it seemed really tough depending on your skill level but I think it's really great experience to be able to build something from scratch, not lean on any frameworks and to kind of figure it out along the way. This I thought was a creative way to do it. I'm curious if you have anything that you would have changed uh, to do this differently, or uh, let me know in the comments below what you learned in this video. I would love to hear from you. As always, thank you for checking out the video. I really appreciate it. I had fun working on the tic-tac-toe and I'll see you in the next one.